Hey class, so this is supposed to be a course on African American religious culture and we are starting with what might look like a history book or perhaps um, African American literature and you might be wondering what does this slave narrative as interesting as it begins it's a pretty intriguing story. It's a jaw-dropping story. But what does it have to do with the study of African American religious culture? So let me pull up my little version here of what happens when you start thinking of religion as an orientation to the ultimate significance of one's place in the world. So the figure in the center of this slide is religious person and religious person although looking perhaps a little bit breasty um, is actually an attempt on my part to make a um, kind of androgynous figure that can be both um, andros and gynos there uh, but maybe the little breasty part works a little better Anyway, this is supposed to be an androgynous figure, and it is supposed to represent not a individual, because in all of the work we do, we will be thinking about subjectivity, about the experience of being human, as that is developed out of the relationship of self to those around the self. So it could focus you in on the idea that we're talking about an individual and that's really just not how religious lives happen they are we are born into the middle of a story it takes storytellers bringing us into the traditions um, it takes uh, the ceremony of multiple people generally for um, the repeated and powerful experiences that become ritualized practices. So don't get stuck on one figure and please try to think with me that we are trying to think sexual difference, ethnic, ethnic difference, um, differences of ability in this figure. All right, so what happens when you think about religion as an orientation and how does that tie us into something called the interesting narrative? A religious person begins first and foremost on the land in this approach to the study of religions. And um, here you see a few, a few points I want to get across in terms of that complex analysis of the person on the land. Um, first of all, you have an overarching horizon. And we can all say that anybody who lives anywhere has a horizon, and that horizon then becomes the limit of their known world. And if you're right off into the west or um, sail out to the ocean uh, following the dawn, you're broadening your horizons, right? Well, in the case of religious person, there's two layers that matter a lot. There is a, you'll see the very top box there says dual temporal modes. So um, part of that cosmic horizon is cosmological time with stellar movements, equinoxes, solstices, seasonal rituals, a sense of a created world. This is where you're getting into a cosmic time and you're interested and in looking in the kind of eternal temporal forces. Star, Earth, um, and the Sun's continual arising and, and falling. Now the second element of that horizon, temporal horizon, is on the scale of the human. And so the first slash there represents the um, birth, and then you've got puberty and those coming-of-age rituals, that you're likely to have the sanctification of reproduction through 
something like marriage, um, and you have death. And so you have four major landmarks, temporal landmarks in a life. So the human life is lived both with a cosmic scale and with its own life cycle scale. Those are two temporal modes that are part of a horizon. Now, those modes meet in the three most important questions. Those three most important questions that anyone, and if any of you guys are geocachers or you like working with maps, you'll know, or even geometry, it, if you can, um, it takes three points to know where you are in three-dimensional space. You can triangulate where you are if you have three points. So those three major points in time, where do we come from, become the creation stories as well as a personal, individual story of what are my roots. Then, what do we do while we're here? That daily question has to do with the ethics, the morality, and the kinds of daily devotions that would direct one into knowing, um, do I work on Sunday or is Sunday a sacred day? And to the extent then that one is living within a culture that maintains a sacred day, like a Sunday, then you wouldn't work. But once that hold begins to dissolve and money becomes the new theology, um, then the devotion comes to work, perhaps. But my point is, this temporal, this second question, what do we do while we're here, then is the second of the three most important questions by which a person on the land figures out, who am I? The third of those questions becomes the future-oriented question, what is the significance of my death? And I've tried to indicate on the screen here with the little arrow pointing down like the cliff of mortality that presses upon the human. Um, we have an awareness about death that makes us um, um, particularly aware of questions of meaning in terms of um, the living and the stories that we tell. So an awareness of death that presses in on us. So with these three questions, where did we come from? What do we do while we're here? What is the significance of my death? Then communities are tri triangulating the meaning of where do I stand? Um, the ground they stand on offers another issue then. It offers a kind of surplus economy, right? I don't know anyone who claims to have built the ground or built a tree or built an ocean. There's a surplus economy of a created, biologically reproducing world that presses up and upon which we depend. And so central to um, religious meaning then is the meaning and value of land. Now once you start thinking about religion this way it starts to make a whole lot more sense why there are conflicts, why territorial conflicts are so often fought regarding religious lines. Because what you are talking about is a human whose relationship to that land is now sacred that surplus economy of the food that keeps you alive, the water that keeps you alive, then becomes a sacred bond, a bond worth living and dying for. Um, also, once one is burying one's people, then one of the truisms that we say in the history of religions is that death adds value to the sacred. So once you are burying your people, then the relationship to land becomes um, just kind of uh, geometrically intensified, you might say. Um, and I think uh, whether we're talking about burying or scattering ashes, probably um, everybody here could have some sense of what, how a death can impact your sense of relationship to place. Now, if you start with a picture of religion 
as an orientation to the ultimate significance of one's place in the world. And then you get brought into the heart and mind of somebody who is ripped from all the fabric and land that they knew and put into the crucible of this second leg of the triangle that would go from um, the colonies to Europe. Actually, it starts in Europe, brings the ship down to Africa, loads with slaves, sends them across the Atlantic um, to sell the slaves, pick up resources there, bring the resources back to Europe. It created a triangle. Funny, there's another triangle. But the Atlantic Triangle, so this second leg, the middle passage is what it is called, then can be thought of um, as an excruciatingly religious experience in that one's whole, entire orientation becomes, you have to go through the crucible of being dehumanized, right? How do you stand in the world when your whole idea of being and your whole fabric is undergoing the process of being dehumanized. So that radical disorientation. And we do this beautiful thing in week two, looking at how Olaude Equiano um, thinks through his dehumanization and begins through the artifacts, the material culture of the slave owners, the books, the pictures, the clocks, begins to re-articulate his humanness. It is exquisite. Um, so that is what we're doing with this book. We are getting into the head and the heart and the experience of somebody enduring the dehumanization and disorientation of the European slave trade as the foundation upon which we will then be able to move through American history and think about African American religious culture. Thanks for listening. I hope that was helpful. Let's see if I can turn it off.